we would like to do a land acknowledgement and just acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. Um, the Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys are originally the homelands of the Salish and Pendereye people who inhabited this land since time immemorial. This area was also frequented by other tribes, including the Kootenai, Blackfeet, Shoshone, Crow, and Kiowa. We honor the original stewards of this land and their descendants, many of whom continue to live, work, teach, create, and learn in this community. We are committed to showing gratitude for the land by respecting it and remembering this in our thoughts and our actions. Thank you. So I, Jesse, I will obviously be starting, but to give a whole host of introductions, here is Stoney Samso. Stoney Samso, as Jesse just mentioned. Um, I am the, uh, what do I do? I'm the executive director and co-founder of Western Montana Creative Initiatives and the Open Air Program. Um, I'm going to give you like the quick skinny of what Open Air is. It's a place-based artist and residence program. We connect artists with unique sites around Western Montana. We're deeply collaborative. We work a lot with community partners to make these residencies par possible. And so right now we have a six week um, session happening and we have nine artists scattered across Western Montana, up in the Flathead Lake, down in the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, over in Phillipsburg, Montana, and then a number of host sites here in the Missoula Valley. Um, these artists are coming from across disciplines. So we have visual artists, we have performers, we have a mime, we have um, a dancer, we have, it's, it's amazing. And there's a lot of writers actually scattered amongst um, all of them. Uh, we love to provide the opportunity for the community to connect with these artists. And a unique thing about residencies, maybe many of you in here are familiar with the term, but um, it's basically an opportunity, a space to um, hold, create a supportive environment, um, financial support, time, community, for an artist to be able to research, get curious, connect, discover. It's really about process. Oftentimes people come into contact with creative practice through a finished result. You go to an exhibition, you go to a performance, you go to the kind of the final node of creative genius. Um, but a residency is about the process that it takes to get to that point. It's about the unknown. It's about the discovery. It's a little more vulnerable. And so when you come to these presentations, you're actually seeing artists in the middle of their creative process. Um, and so we are bold in asking them to come up and share their process with you. And so that's what you're gonna come into contact with today. And so especially, I, I wanna kind of give that context as we're standing here in a, in a performance space. And so oftentimes this container, maybe a, an audience might have an assumption about what they come into contact with ins inside of a performance space. So this is gonna be a little more process-based. Um, okay, that, that's enough about that. Um, so I, I just wanna acknowledge some of our supporters. Our work is made possible um, by a, a host of um, individuals such as yourselves. Um, also our, our, our work is made possible by support from the National Endowment for the Arts from the Laura Grace Barrett Family Foundation Fund and from the Llewellyn Foundation. We also would like to acknowledge and thank our luminary sponsors this year with Clyde Coffee and Blackfoot Communications. Um, and then uh, uh, last but certainly not least, we're so grateful to our site residency partners. So um, Doug Imlin with the Imlin Evolutionary Biology Lab, the College of Arts and Media for their support and hosting us today in this space, um, and Westside Theater for hosting Julin across town. Um, it, it's been, it's wonderful how many community partners come together to make this actually happen. And so before we introduce Jesse, who's gonna kick us off, actually I'd like to invite Doug Inland up here to ground a little bit about the lab, the Evolutionary Biology Lab, where they have been in residence during this time. What is that, we ask? Doug will answer. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear? So I'm Doug Emlin. I'm an evolutionary biologist on the faculty here at the University of Montana. 
and the students in my lab and I, we research sort of crazy extremes in animals, like tusks and antlers, or in most of the time our case, the horns that you see on rhinoceros beetles, and there's some awesome illustrations over there, of what it might be like to carry armaments like that around through your daily lives. We have students from the University of Montana go do field work in places. I've got students going to Japan and Korea, leaving in the next week to study the beetles in the field. But we discovered sort of by accident, students actually discovered, that the beetles not only battle with each other with these weapons to fight over territories the same way that deer or elk might guard access to a harem, but after doing all these fights to guard a territory, the females come into these territories and they completely ignore the males and they reject all the males. And the males climb onto the backs of the females and begin to sing. And we now know that they do three different types of song and they do these jiggling, head bobbing dances. Nobody expected that from these beetles. It's been sort of a wild, fun journey to try to figure out what's going on with these behaviors. And so while we've been doing the science, it's been a really fun opportunity, the first time for us to partner with an organization that sponsors the art, to have these two incredibly talented artists just hanging out in residence in the lab, listening to recordings of the beetles and watching videos of the insects and actually studying the animals and sort of being immersed in the chaos of a lab trying to get people ready to go to field work in another country. It's been a joy to have them in the lab and I'm super excited to see what they've been able to come up with. So, thanks. Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Kelly Sinner. I am the program coordinator for Open Air. And just to let you know what's going to go on tonight, uh, first of all, Jessie's going to give her presentation and then we're gonna take a little bit of a, um, just a real brief intermission, and then Julin will do her presentation. And then after they're both done, that's when we'll do question and answer for both artists. And then after that, we will have some snacks. So um, outside, after we're done with the event, please stick around and meet the artists and come have some treats with us, okay. So to introduce Jesse. Jesse, also known as George Harvey, is a Montana-born freelance composer and teacher, gardener and reader, thinker and walker. Works are based in the natural world, integrating social curiosity and environmental causes, described by Seattle Mag as full of surprises and consistently attention-holding, and clarinetist Julia Lahid is diving into the absurd corners of the human condition, the moments where you have to laugh so you don't cry. Their work by the nature of our conversation was awarded first place at the 2020 Dark Water Women in Music Festival's competition, composition competition. <laughs> Jesse has been commissioned by Opera Elect, the Art Song Collaborative Project, Karen Stevens Dance, and LA duo Strange Interlude, among others. Music has been performed throughout the United States and Canada, including the Waterloo Contemporary Music Sessions, Music by Women Festival, and the Montreal Contemporary Music Lab. So, welcome Jesse. you know you are about to lose your cell phone service. <laughs> I have no idea what the internet status is yet. Um, and you cannot get local stations without some serious antenna action. Um, so what I did as a child is I was outside, is I gardened, which I obviously still do. I walked, I read books in my apple trees, and I was just in nature, and that is the roots of my music. So, I 
write music based in a love and curiosity of nature, and with the even bigger hope to share that love and curiosity with the listeners. I've written about the migration patterns of the olive-sided sided flycatcher, the path of the Gulf Stream, and it's very sad slowing down in, in the current state, the rhizomal root systems of the daisy, and a whole bunch more. Um, what I do with each of my pieces is I do a lot of research into what I'm writing about and I learn as much as I can and from there I transform that information into my structure and a story that I kind of, it's like a visual movie is happening as I write a piece. Techniques used, obviously a whole bunch. I use a combination of traditional notation, improvisational aspects, graphics, scoring, performance directions, poetry, and illustration. So this is a very recent piece. It's for improvised uh, contrabass clarinet and looping pedal. Um, it is both a very silly song about the process of growing potatoes, which is my favorite thing to grow, and also uh, about the paths we take through life because you can choose your own way through this piece. So that's why at the top it says two through five. It can be at any points in movements two through five. So this, this is by the nature of our conversation. This piece describes and is about one of the major things I think about a lot in my music um, and use nature to process. And it's both very personal to me as someone who has a lot of anxiety and doing something like this causes a lot of anxiety and also is talked about in the news a lot um, and that is the confusion of communication how do we communicate uh, how do we describe something using the right words how do you make a new friend how do you unmake a new friend um, <laughs> And so this is one of the pieces I've written about it. Um, in this piece, it's a structured improvisation based on the four elements and the four seasons. So it starts out by earth and spring. So it's the, uh, hello. And then it moves to air and summer, where you start doing your water cooler talk. Fall and water is where you get into the deep, deep, you know, topics of philosophy, your hopes, your dreams. And this page is um, fire and winter, when you reach the topic where you cannot agree. And it ends, at the very bottom, you just see some notes. So throughout this process, the performers have been using a lot of different techniques and little notational sets, and they get to choose how their information or their conversation ends. So we're gonna watch a little clip of this. This was the world premiere of this song at the Montreal Contemporary Music Lab um, back in 2019, I think, um, performed by the amazing Christine Elizabeth Hurney on clarinet and Emily Kennedy on the cello. Um, so we'll first see a little bit of the chunk uh, where that the last score page was referring to. It's not your typical music piece. <laughs> <laughs>
that comes up a lot in my pieces, and you've heard it a lot today, and I say this word a lot in describing my music, is um, this idea of process. Is I'm really fascinated by the process of things. And not just normal, everyday processes, but I am interested in big or really small processes. And humans in general are awful about conceptualizing and understanding geologic and microscopic process. So what I like to do in my music is if I'm looking at a process, um, is I like to reframe it, reconceptualize it, and make it into something that maybe is a little bit more understandable or gives just a little glimpse of the, the scale of what I'm working with. Um, one of my favorite pieces uh, I've written about this is called 10,000 Years of Rumbling. Um, and it's a solo piano piece that traces obviously the last 10,000 years of eruption history of Washington's five active volcanoes and crunches it into about 20 minutes. And this is not that piece. It, this is a piece called, this is my one and only graphic score. It's called Night Waves and it's about the ocean at night. Okay, so summarize, those are just some of the areas I work with in my music. Um, I also really love dealing with humor. Um, I like to make up stories, which you'll definitely hear in this next clip. And um, it, but those are kind of, I would say the main features. So kind of to summarize, this is Lemur Meets Panda. Um, I wrote this piece um, during 2020 where I wanted to write something really, really joyful. Um, it was a commission by uh, two of my undergraduate cohorts who formed the LA duo Strange Interlude and we had recently reconnected and they commissioned me for this piece and they were also like, please write us something happy. Um, so I asked them, what's your favorite animals? And it is obviously a panda, which is endangered, and a lemur, specifically an ii, which is also endangered. And to create this piece, I did a lot of research, and then the story is the imagined pen pal ship of an ii and a panda, and how they became friends. Um, in the clip you're going to hear, it is the end of their kind of back and forth of, do you like the nights? No, I like the day. Do you like this? No, I like that. Oh, okay. And then at the very end of it is the one thing that everyone can agree on. Both animals love to eat. presentation because it's like 20 minutes long. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to move on now to dun, 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 the star of the show, Rhino Beetles. 
So I was so excited when I saw this opportunity to come up because um, I love rhino beetles. I was thinking about why I was so excited um, to apply for this and actually uh, for those with small children, if you've ever gotten a cricket magazine, they have all their little characters go through the bottom of the magazine and one of their little characters is a rhino beetle. So I've been seeing rhino beetles since I was extra short. Um, and then because so much of my building and my music is research based, it was really excited to be in a place of research. I normally am just doing everything the best I can on my own through local libraries or the internet. Um, but it was phenomenal because Doug sent me an entire Dropbox folder filled with 109 files based on insect stridulation, which is when they rub parts of their body together to make the uh, sound. Um, Sophie was amazing and gave me access to all of last year's sound files of the rhino beetle mating trials, uh, which was about 100 files ranging from 10 minutes to two hours long. And yes, I went through every single one of them. Um, and then it was also just the ability to talk to people about the insects, about kind of, I went around for like a week and just went, if you were a rhino beetle, what instrument would you be? Um, so it was amazing just to talk to people about that. Um, what's come out of that is three different pieces, and it's been really fun because I've been using the same melodic and rhythmic content, which we'll talk a little bit of how I got it. Uh, with every single piece and just slowly making it more and more complicated. Uh, rhino beetles have, as Doug said, three songs. They have an A song, which kind of sounds like a little squeaky balloon. Um, they have a B song, and the A song is used mostly for alerts and talking to male, other males. The B song is just for females, and it kind of sounds like the insect version of a purr. And the C song is when the it gets really exciting and you get cool rhythms is because it combines the A and B song. So all of these pieces are using ideas that combine A, B, and then C is A plus B. So we're going to listen to this clip, um, a little bit of this clip of the rhino beetles, and you'll kind of hear some of the really amazing sounds that they can make. Um, pay very close attention to the beginning so sounds because I use those in the first song that Uh, the second part is all MIDI instruments, 
um, that are used in the program, and the third part is the two combined. Um, if you feel the urge to dance, that would be great. <laughs> They kind of have this very up and down motion. With the B songs, they go side to side. 
and with the seesongs, it turns into a figure eight. And what you'll find is in this song, you can kind of trace the motion that I'm, I'm playing with. It also tells the epic story of courtship, rejection, renewed courtship, and glorious gene pool success. Um, <laughs> the clip that you heard that the, the techno song kept going um, is transformed into flute melodies, so that will come back. And yeah, here we go. string octet, which will be about 12 to 15 minutes long, which will trace in three movements the full uh, mating process of the rhino beetles from spreading out finding food and spreading out an aggregation pheromone to the start of three to six weeks of battles to the ultimate expression of this very silly love song that I've written. Um, and there may be dancing to go with it, but we'll see. Um, thank you so much again. I guess we're taking a short break, and then it's time to figure out what those are all about. <laughs> <laughs>